Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, there's a... Not much to tell. I had a, another jaunt into New York City last week to meet with a, a private equity guy for work stuff and, and record this week's podcast. That meant riding some pretty crowded subways, but uh, it's been a week. I seem to have still dodged COVID. I also dodged the Mocha Comics Festival in, the New, in New York City last weekend for the same reason. Um a lot of my pals were there, and I'm sure it would have been great to, to catch up with people and maybe line up some future episodes. But uh, yeah, I just couldn't add that much more risk to you know everything that's gone on. Um, I don't know. The, the one weird thing that did happen in the past week is that I <laughs> I did my taxes yesterday. That is, I, I got the documents and figures together for my accountant. It's late, but he'll file an extension, I'm sure. But what's funny is... In order to do it, I had to sort this this pile of bills and paperwork that I have in in one square of an IKEA Calax unit here in my office. Now, in the before time, you know, I would always clean out that stack, usually during Christmas week, you know, around there. The work would lessen. I'd have time to really go through that and the, the stack of work uh, papers, too, you know, filing stuff away, getting most of the tax related info together and, and squared away. But, but I looked over and this thing is just comically out of control. So over the, the months of 2022, between looking at that and my run of the mill anxiety, I was staring down a massive stack of documents that needed sorting and filing or else I wasn't going to be able to, to get all the tax stuff together or I'd have to make stuff up. Um, I did it. I, I, got all the numbers squared away. I zapped everything over to the accountant. Um, but, you know, to do that, I had to just clear out this huge area of floor space and dump all these papers there and start sorting, you know, each set of bills by by chronology because I'm insane. Um, but the funny thing was when I, I did that, just about every one of the bills, you know, the credit cards, utilities, all the, the different stuff, the date for the earliest one was January or February of 2020, like that was the moment where the routine stopped, where everything that was normal was was upended. It's like an emblem of entropy, like it, it's a symbol of not how time stopped, but how how order stopped, I guess. So I got my shit together. I exerted some control over my little corner of the universe and and i guess that was meaningful that's something to share with you we'll see if i get a refund now let's get to this week's show um my guest is the author and we'll say teacher nicholas del banco who was last on the podcast in fall of 2017 and this month saw the paperback release of his newest book why writing matters from yale university press why Writing Matters, um, despite coming from a university press, is not a dry academic book. It is a gorgeous and glorious celebration of writing and an exploration of the work that goes into good writing and a tribute to the, the books and teachers that transform our lives and, and the world around us. So over the course of nine chapters, uh, Nicholas goes deep on the craft of writing with vivid examples from his own work, uh, that of some of his students, some of whom are, are very well-known writers now. Um, and he gets into the, the act of revision in ways that subtly rewrite the book itself in, in the process, uh, not in a way that's going to distract you necessarily, but it shows you what work goes into writing and what it takes to, to get something better. You know, to, to, to really work the prose until it, it shines. He also 
tells stories from his decades in writing and teaching, including a, a series of anecdotes about uh, John Updike, John Gardner, and James Baldwin, um, which sort of remind you that no matter how solitary the act of writing is, it can bring you into this this society of writers that may enrich your life, or at least, you know, keep you swimming in great anecdotes. But seriously, why writing matters is wonderful. And and it shows how it shows readers how how writers progress from imitation and overt influence into an original voice. There's still influence there and and Nicholas and I talk about the various influences and and how you shed them consciously and what they do to you underneath. But but anyway, the other thing this book has is a chapter on the exercises in the strategies and prose MFA course that Nicholas has taught for decades. And that by itself is worth the, the price of the book. Um, it's, it's some really amazing writing exercises that, as I think I mentioned in the conversation, uh, really helped me to understand how I was never going to be serious, serious as a writer, uh, that I never would have put in that level of work to really make something um, effective. Instead, you know, I, I half-ass it by, well, well, we'll get into all that stuff later. Anyway, Why Writing Matters imparts the wisdom of a life spent writing and, and teaching writing. And Nicholas does it all in a friendly voice. It's never lofty. It's never, you know, a Olympian and looking down on the reader, but it brings you in. Um, it's a really wonderful accomplishment, this book. I loved Why Writing Matters. And it has semi sorta got me back to looking at my own amateur prose and, and poems, um, trying to figure out what could work and, and what needs a lot of work. We'll, we'll put it that way. Um, uh, might result in another issue of, of my zine haiku for business travelers. We'll, we'll see. But meanwhile, let's get to the conversation. Now, uh, this was in person. So as caveats go, there was some heavy New York city noise, uh, sirens, construction vehicles or whatever. And because of mic placement and Nicholas's kind of quiet voice, I had to, to do some work to clean up the audio. So it may be a little, um, well, it just won't be as, as consistently, you know, the same volume and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, I'll give you your money back if you're not happy with it. Oh, also we kind of fall right into the conversation. Uh, as context goes, we were talking about Ed Sorrell and he was praising him as the Thomas Nast of our time and how a hundred years from now they're going to look back and say Ed Sorrell was the figure um, and how sometimes we might be too in our own moment sometimes to, to understand greatness that's contemporary. So keep that in mind when I start off by prattling about Hemingway and Death in the Afternoon. Now here's Nicholas's bio. Nicholas Del Banco is the Robert Frost Distinguished University Professor Emeritus of English Language and Literature at the University of Michigan. He has published 30 previous books of fiction and nonfiction, including The Count of Concord, Spring and Fall, The Countess of, Sin of Stanline Restored, and The Lost Suitcase, Reflections on the Literary Life. And now... The 2022 Virtual Memories Conversation with Nicholas Del Banco. Gosh, I forget who I was reading. Uh, Hemingway's Death in the Afternoon. I was recording mm -hmm. with David Thompson and he mm -hmm. made a mm -hmm. reference to it. And I'd never read it. And realizing it and realizing or reading it and realizing in the moment. He's literally writing about books coming out from Faulkner and Virginia Woolf. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, well, Those what, also ran. So. Yeah, what was it possibly have been like to just, oh, yeah, the new one from Woolf is yeah, out and the new Faulkner. Right, and it's, right. oh, yeah, this is. Well, that was a, that was a different time. I mean, I think that. It's an ongoing question, um, though. It, it, we were on. Yeah, we're recording. Right, okay. well, we may as well dive sure. right in. What is greatness? Uh, I guess. Well, I, I do think the literary landscape in that regard has, has altered. I mean, when I was a. A kid, um, it had three mountain peaks in America, and they were Hemingway, Fitzgerald, and Faulkner, and everybody else was a, at best a foothill. Um, and now there are no such titans who loom large over the landscape in the same way. Uh, but there are many more uh, promontories, many more yeah. uh, who are. Um, 
to use Hemingway's uh, vocabulary, contenders and, 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 uh, and prominent. Um, and I think that's a lot closer to the way things should be, really. Um, it does cause me to think back, though not to research in any sufficient way, what it was really like to live in Dickens's London um, or, you know, Trollope's um, or Thackeray's and, and those are the three names that, that now emerge, yeah. but at the time they were probably um, surrounded uh, by folk who, who could claim equal prominence. Not Dickens, he was a, a bestseller in, in the, in the preliminary way of, that it now happens, but by, by which I mean he prefigured the idea of celebrity uh, yeah. author. Um, but, you know, the, the forest for the trees idea is, is, is a complicated one, because now we're all a bunch of trees and wondering what the forest looks like. One thing that's inarguably the case is that it's uh, more very colored and, and more culturally uh, various, and no one can complain about that. And it is that question. It's one that's come up over the years with the show, the role of greatness. And it's mm -hmm. a thing, when you combine that with the, the lack of diversity in past eras, a lot of the, the older cartoonists, I sit down with the Jules Pfeiffer, Ed Sorrell, mm -hmm. um, in, in other parts of their world, guys like Milton Glaser, etc. My wife asks, were there women who mm. were comparable? And I said, unfortunately, I think there were a few, but they just were denied those opportunities in general. So you don't get them in their 80s and 90s to sit down with and, and have those conversations. I don't know enough about this. I mean, I, I, I mean, with I, literature I, also. I, I, I certainly fields. know that in terms of literature, there were women. In terms of the cartoonists, I'm not sure that that was a yeah. A profession available uh, to, right. the, to staff side. It was the guys. Right. It was Kurtzman and Eisner right. and, and right. the whole world. Right. right. Um, and that was by and large true of the visual arts, uh, though by the time that you know we're talking about the Hemingway um, Faulkner emergence, they were recognized uh, painters of consequence uh, who were female, but nothing like what what at present obtains and you know if you read the New York Sunday book review you're hard pressed to find a man in it uh, yeah. nowadays so there's a there's been a correction with a vengeance which I'll say is a good thing I mean I know there's the the whole Steve Bannon you know right. all the, right. the women right. are going to take over it's like you know all things considered we've done a really crap job for, for a while I know the pendulum always swings too far and there's I think that's an accurate assessment. Yeah. Um, I, I was uh, I had dinner a few nights ago with a fellow who I think I will keep nameless uh, for the best. Not uh, not because he uh, uh, he said anything with which I disagreed, but it was notable. He's a very eminent playwright, one of the you know five or ten that you could name if you yeah. could name that many playwrights. Um, but he's having a lot of trouble getting his work produced because, as he puts it, he's a middle-aged, elderly, white male. And, See, this uh, is my latest excuse for not writing. I figure, well, nobody's <laughs> going to want to read my stuff anyway because I'm a I'm middle-aged white guy. And, and you uh, know, so I can come up with many excuses. The craft you put into writing, I put into excuses not to write. And I, and I think those work really well. well. It, it, it's, uh, it requires the same energy, I'm yeah, sure. It's true. <laughs> with the neuroses, at least I get nothing out of it. That's, right. that's what's really great. But If, if I may uh, play off of that for a moment, I, I still am uh, the... Um, almost addicted author that you interviewed years ago, which is to say I still get up early every day. And which is actually a question I, of mine. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm almost never as late as 6 o'clock at, at my uh, work desk, and I do that seven days a week and 52 weeks a year, um, which explains the multitude of titles, if nothing else. So I have the habit of getting up and working, and I did that again this morning. Um, and I've been working on something which I might happily talk about uh, in a bit because, in fact, it, it, it relates to why writing matters. 
but um, I'm really incompetent technically. I had a, if I had my total druthers, I'd be back on the, uh, if not the quill pen, because I can't read my handwriting, <laughs> uh, the portable typewriter. Um, and I managed to eradicate uh, about 50,000 words of a novel that I'm on. I'm sure it's there somewhere. We can find it. Uh, um, <laughs> you know, if you want me to take the computer and try to figure it out after we're done. I, I may ask you to, but I did call for expert help and oh, good, couldn't. Good. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Okay. Um, and they said it's actually not here. Um, we'll see. Yeah. But um, anyway, uh, I had backed it up um, up until about 10 days ago, but... There were about 50 pages that I'd been transcribing and working away that had gone. So um, I confronted about an hour before you came here the, that urgent question, does it matter? <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in my case, because of that, the habits of composition to which I refer, I'll probably just do them again. You yeah. know, I, I have a kind of access to the material. I had a way back when TypeScript. Um, and it, it, it won't cost me anything but a week's repeated and interminable labor. Um, and you could weave in the weave in the, the Penelope reference, too. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. Just undoing your work and going right back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, but it was a very vivid, um, I wouldn't call it exactly an instruction so much as an example of you know, what it means to be regularly at work and then have the work come to nothing. Um, and uh, so tomorrow morning I'll start to recoup or try. Before we started recording, we talked about my impending death, which is not mm -hmm. impending, impending, except, you know, yeah. it's programmed. Do you look back at your body of work and think about what you've done? Uh, which is to ask, yes. you know, how, how do you uh, think about death? Uh, I do. Um, I was one of those fortunate children who had his work published early yeah. uh, and uh, I am now no longer a fortunate <laughs> child so that my first novel appeared in 1966 which is actually five years before I was a twinkle in my mother's eye yeah, precisely <laughs> so longer than you've been alive and therefore there is a body of work if nothing else um, 31 books um, plus all the books I've edited or co-edited or what have you. And um, it's impossible not to, to reconsider uh, or to look back over them at, at, at some point, and this is increasingly that point. Um, what was the specific question? Do, do I... Do you feel it's come... Do you feel it was worth it, I suppose? Uh, and we could talk about teaching and what that has meant also, but... It is so deeply ingrained in me by now that I, I no longer even entertain those questions. Yeah. I don't feel as if I had any choice. Mm -hmm. um, my wife is um, preternaturally gifted musically, by which I mean uh, she has never heard a, a note uh, that she can't retain, um, give her a a phrase from almost anything she's ever heard and she will know what succeeded or preceded it. And her father, who was a famous um, concert performer, I mean, a, a very eminent classical musician, uh, said uh, he was a vain uh, and an egotistical man, but he said and meant it uh, that she had a better ear than he uh, and a, a greater talent than he. Nonetheless, she gave it up, um, playing the cello and composing, and and um, never took it seriously as as a as a career. Never uh, embarked upon it as a career, except briefly in music management. And I don't think, which is a long way around to answering your question, I don't think it has cost her much. Mm -hmm. um, there's no sense on her part of. Oh, I shoulda, coulda, woulda. Um, she did, in fact, write a novel um, about the experience of being a, a, a classical musician. But, um, but I don't sense in her uh, the, 
a forlorn feeling that she took the wrong turning or gave something up to which she was so um, entirely committed. For me, it would not be the case. I cannot imagine myself in any other context than as a wordsmith of, of one sort or another. Um, I suppose it's possible I could have been a doctor, a lawyer, or an Indian chief, and maybe I would have made a living at them, but I wouldn't have had a life in them the way I feel I've had a life in language. So, no, I don't, I don't um, think about alternatives. Um, there is that aspect of, of human intelligence which I suppose those who've studied it uh, have some sense of. Um, I only notice it anecdotally. I have an ear for language. I have a retentive ear for, for poems I have read, uh, for um, characters I encountered 40 years ago in chapter seven. Uh, and um, that's with me when I will forget the piece of music I heard yesterday or not be able to identify the, the, the painting that uh, I look at, um, looked at last week. My father um, had a visual eye. I mean, he had some trouble remembering me. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I'm not being serious. He was, was family-centered and family-proud. But he, he was forgetful and inattentive about any number of things. He knew which Matisse he had seen on what southwest wall of which museum in 1939. Um, so that uh, there's a visual intelligence. My wife has an aural intelligence, an audio intelligence. And mine has to do with language, um, much to my own delight and to those around me um, who who intermittently complain about it and say, shut up. <laughs> why do you have to remember that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or why do you have to repeat it? Yes, yeah. that's a voice. Um, so beyond the, the legacy of your own bookshelf, I, I see Jessamyn Ward's books behind mm. us on, on the shelf mm. here. That sense of, of students of yours succeeding beyond uh, maybe any reckoning you have for them? No, which yes. isn't to say you underestimate your... Uh, that's a badly phrased uh, question. Just the success of your, your students. I, I think that's... I know it's true for me, and I think it's true for most writers who teach, and by now most writers do teach. We take uh, a kind of a pride by adjacency in the achievements of our students, so that I do tend to puff my chest out a little bit when people mm -hmm. mention Jessamyn um, and... You know, and others uh, I have taught who are either bestsellers or, or, or appropriately prominent. Um, I think that began uh, when I was not much more than the kid who uh, published his first novel at, at 23, and I was teaching at Bennington, and one of my first students was Brett Ellis, um, who... Uh, who actually published his first novel, Less Than Zero, younger than I did. So I could, uh, I could arm wrestle with him about that. But in one way or another, uh, for the 50 years that I did teach, I took great pride in and retained great interest in the work of my students. And I don't think any teacher worth his salt would be able would say otherwise. As it happens, um, I have taught a lot of successful writers and hope that um, those who teach themselves now are um, about to do the same for the next generation. It's one form of immortality and probably a little more liable to be banked on or relied on than, than the conviction that my seventh novel will return to print. <laughs> that sort of thing. Well, you had that touching moment in the book with a student writing you about how the course changed her life or something mm -hmm. you'd said had, and yet she had not gone on to a, a writing career and you didn't actually remember her in the, the, the moment. 
Um, and I do sort of wonder about that. I mean, I, I get people with the occasional, oh, that episode you did with blah, blah, blah. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, I mm-hmm. don't remember that, but thank you. Mm-hmm. I, I mm-hmm. tend to have to keep moving on to the next one. But but that, you know, a different sort of, I don't want to say pride, but again, that, that sense that you, you mattered. And, and it's so hard to know what does matter when. Uh, I mean by that, that um, most people I know, and I certainly number myself among them, have a, have a vivid recollection of being touched by teachers. Mm-hmm. It's not clear to me that the teachers knew they were doing so. Right. Um, and of, 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 you know, back to your earlier image of the cartoon, a little, little light bulb going yeah. off. Um, because somebody has said something to which you uh, respond, and um, that's that's an important thing to feel one has done with one's life. Uh, if I were uh, surrounded by you know five hundred people uh, who I've had in one way or another in a, in, a, in a writing seminar or a lecture hall. Who all said, "Yeah, they remembered that when they responded to this." Um, I would feel very happy. So, tell me about why writing matters, mm. both the book and and you know the notion. Well, it, it, it's one and the same, really. Uh, the Yale University Press has this series called, you know, in effect, "Why X Matters." Why? architecture matters, why baseball matters, why when they flatteringly asked me to to talk about why writing matters, uh, it seemed like a natural thing to say yes, and one I was very happy to do. In some sense, the book kind of lay down on the computer page and, uh, and asked to be typed, because it had been, uh, in a very real sense, my life's work. I began to teach when I was 23, um, and have only recently retired. And now you uh, said recently retired in 2017, also. So yeah. I don't know how recent. Well, <laughs> that's, uh, in comparison to 50 years, yes, that's recent. But. Yeah, but in, in the in the subsequent years, I did some teaching up at Columbia, yeah. and uh, I've just agreed to do a, a class in Hawaii and fall and. <laughs> Hard hardships, uh, hard postings. I'm sure they had to uh, twist your own. In, in 2017, I had li- literally recently retired. Yeah. But when you are, uh, when no years go by in terms of five year in- intervals or, or ten year uh, intervals, um, the word recent is uh, doesn't mean last week. Uh, but you were what saying, I, the what book. I, yeah, what I was going to, I think I say this in that prologue. Um, the book's been a long time of boarding. I mean, I, I first started uh, publishing uh, pieces of it as long ago as uh, whenever that first piece in Harper's was about a class I was teaching at Bennington. Um, and so it's been a haul. Uh, and uh, it was, you know, there was a certain amount of of new work to do and a certain amount of new reading uh, to engage in, but it was more a summing up than, than an exploration, if you, if you know what I mean. Um, more a retrospective and a prospective project. Did it change in the course of writing? Were there things that surprised you or, or things you learned from in the process? Um, Yes, uh, a good deal of it changed uh, in, in, in the course of composition. First of all, the shape of the book changed with some regularity. Yeah. Each of the chapters was, was uh, discreet, uh, as in um, separately focused on a component part of the whole. Um, and uh, I played with their sequence and what would go where, as you know, it, begins with a testimonial to teachers and ends with a you know, sort of um, piano praise to students. Yeah. Um, and in between, uh, there's one chapter that, that deals with uh, five texts that are arguably 
important to our culture, demonstrate the proposition that writing does matter, um, and changed uh, the world in little and large ways. Uh, there, uh, it was hugely uh, difficult for me to decide which five to pick, yeah. um, and that chapter changed a lot in the course of its composition. But mostly the, um, uh, the the thing that changed was the shape of the whole. And uh, for instance, I ended it with uh, a disquisition on the Rosetta Stone, which um, came out of the blue, yeah. uh, or perhaps a visit to the British Museum. <laughs> and uh, and also there was a, a disquisition or. A, brief uh, discursus on handwriting analysis and autographs and, uh, yeah. and that happened just because at the Morgan Library I went to a, uh, to a show that showed you know, postcards from yeah. Napoleon um, and it sent me to thinking. So of course uh, a book that's, uh, that's entirely envisioned uh, from the get-go is not one worth writing. Uh, there were things that came uh, in the course of composition, uh, that, or, or altered in the course of composition, that mattered very much. Nonetheless, um, when I signed on uh, with Yale, uh, I kind of knew that writing mattered, at least to me, yeah. and I was going to try and make it matter to others. <laughs> I did want to thank you for the graphology section because when we talked five years ago, uh, you mentioned how absolutely atrocious your handwriting is, so I was glad to see there be a callback that explained exactly how you ended up with, with such terrible handwriting Good that you, you actually find it unreadable yourself. Yeah. But, but I yeah. do. But that sense of, of I'd say, playfulness to it, the, the imitations and, and repetitions and... and the fun that you seem to have, to have within it. Mm -hmm. Did you feel sort of licensed to, this I, doesn't have to be a textbook, this has to be... You know. Well, that, that's another thing that I um, really was puzzling out in the course of composition, how much fun I could have uh, in what is, after all, an essentially earnest proposition that writing should matter. And I had um, produced in the interval since last I saw you, first and last I saw you, um, uh, an endless uh, textbook itself in which uh, uh, fun was, was, was hard to come by. Um, many thousands of pages uh, on literature, craft and voice it was called, from McGraw Hill in which I hoped to coin the textbook market. And instead I planned the buggy whip market. Oops. <laughs> well, roughly speaking, by the time the textbook was finished, nobody was buying them anymore. Um, but uh, I mention it uh, only by uh, way of contrast, say, their are footnotes and appendices and yeah. uh, the apparatus of, of a scholarly uh, exactness um, was crucial. In this case, I didn't even have an appendix. I uh, just sort of said, well, you know, these are books in my head, and, and if these are their names if you want to look them up, kind of thing. But um, it, it was a light, uh, I didn't want the, the footprint or the palm press to be over heavy in it. And so, yes, I did allow myself to have fun. Yeah under the assumption that perhaps the reader would too. Any, I was gonna say, any editorial feedback that, that was one of those, God, I would love to include this, but, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I could see this being a problem. Um, or just not going over. University you know. presses, unlike the, uh, the, the commercial presses that I've worked with for novels and such like, um, tend to... Uh, have the editorial feedback very uh, earnestly uh, as as the first act, by which I mean they send your prospectus out to syndics and uh, readers who are allowed to opine as to whether it is or isn't worth uh, the publishing. So there was a lot of sort of suggestions for shaping uh, at, at, at the beginning of the project. In the course of the composition and at the end of it, no, they left me alone. 
Now, one of the chapters you, you dive into borrowing and and mm -hmm. and imitation. You have a section on what well, various examples of maybe plagiarism, maybe not, and and what constitutes that in a literary sense. But you also go into the the Bloomian, you know, need to, to overcome right. a, a right. literary precursor, right. which raises the question: Who did you see as your your precursors? Who you ultimately had to to in this case, to use the term trump? Uh, oh, just in your writing when you were developing, was there a moment of I'm you know, writing? I, I I'm was, too influenced by X and need to to supersede this. I was thinking about that actually just recently. I mean, simply to repeat. Uh, a pair of names that impressed me very much. Um, well, all three of them did. The, 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 those mountain men I, I referred to that one read in the 50s when I was first starting to read seriously. Sure, I copied Hemingway. Sure, I copied Faulkner. Sure, I copied Fitzgerald. But I think um, the process of growth is not so much the process of outgrowing um, the model or the, uh, the figure who influenced you as um, sort of shedding the skin and, um, and moving to another influence uh, turn by turn. Um, my wife is, is reading it at my suggestion a... Uh, a relatively little-known novel by Nabokov called Pnin. Mm -hmm. um, and Which I own but have not read. Oh, it's a charming and yeah. a delightful, uh, kind of a, a clever romp of a book, which uh, is why I persuaded her to read it. And um, there was a time when I think I read everything that Nabokov had, had published, um, and that was a great deal. And he was greatly important to me. But it's a little bit like um, inviting a kid to work in a, in a uh, bakery and saying, sure, you can have all the chocolate you want. Um, <laughs> you know, after uh, the third week and the 30th pound of chocolate, you, you, you find that you, you don't need it anymore. I'm not sure that's a, an appropriate um, emblem for... Uh, the idea of influence, but what I'm trying to say is that the four men I've just named were hugely important to me once, and they aren't any longer. Yeah. Um, whether that's growth or exhaustion or uh, the, the loss of um, uh, that wide-eyed, open-eared, and youthful desire to be uh, impressed and, and, and a disciple, I'm not sure. It's harder for me to find an influence any longer is what I'm working and trying to say. Yeah. And that's what I sort of wonder, and, uh, reaching that point in your writing and recognizing that you've achieved that, if it's an achievement, if you consider it. It's not clear to me that it is an achievement. It is certainly clear to me that it's uh, an event. I mean, there comes a time when I admire a book, but I don't try and copy it. Yeah. Um, or I recognize an author uh, is uh, extremely good, uh, and he or she is extremely good without me, <laughs> as, yeah. as it were. Um, whereas it used to be that, that I you know, set out to acquire this turn of phrase, that placement of a comma, that uh, length of of the sentence, um, I now just sort of let the style uh, belong to its originator, who of course isn't the original in the first place, uh, and two is a copy. What I think I'm trying to say is that as you grow older, you become an amalgam of so many uh, separate influences and so many voices that you try to, to learn how to copy that you become, in effect, your own original, mm -hmm. rather than uh, your uh, your slavish adept. Um, it's a little bit the way uh, actors who are trained in accents uh, you know, move from role to role, and then perhaps find their own voice. It's yeah, certainly an ongoing question 
for me in, in those terms mm-hmm. as to you know when somebody finds the voice exactly um, and when they recognize finding it versus backing into it and not quite realizing that they've become who they've become. Well, well that's um, perhaps worth discussing at a little greater length because in fact I do refer to it in Why Writing Matters. I. I have, as I said, published 31 books, and uh, I have a few still kind of in process uh, that I'm hoping will appear in the foreseeable future. But Now, now, I, the last two years have taught us the words foreseeable future don't <laughs> exist. <laughs> they don't mean well, anything. Well, so. that's exactly so. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think I only had one novel which I never published. Uh, and which I knew even in the writing, yeah. or just after the writing, it was a mistake. Um, Updike, to whom I refer at uh, admiring length in, in this book, had written quite a lot of stuff that he knew was his what his left hand was up to, but the right hand was the one that was worth publishing. And, and there are other authors, I think, who, who recognize that certain texts should be jettisoned either in the process or at the end. Um, I, I've had the good or the bad luck of seeing most everything I, I wrote, at least in the early years, come into print. The, the salient and important exception was this novel called Blumenberg the Elder, which um, I wrote in a great burst of self-congratulatory enthusiasm about uh, 40 years ago. Um, uh, I had already published, I think, four books, and um, I was sort of hitting, I thought, my adult stride, and I said, what the hell, let me do uh, my version of, of, of Bellows Henderson, The Rain King, or, or um, an extravaganza. And I wrote this rather long novel, um, in a frenzy of, of, of self-congratulation <laughs> and, and quick typing. And um, when it was over, uh, showed it to my then editor, <clears throat> my wife, one or two uh, good friends, I think uh, John Gardner was among them, um, and they all sort of looked at me and said, you know, take two aspirin and, and, and call us in the morning. Um, and um, I knew enough, I guess, at the time to know that it was a pile of pretentious nonsense and, and should be shelved. And I <clears throat> mentioned it. Didn't, didn't it didn't hit you in, in the moment, though. No, in the moment I was just a, just a frenzy of... Um, yeah, self-congratulations, please, as you said. Right, right, right. <laughs> and, and also pleasure. Uh, yeah. It was fun to write. Mm-hmm. So in uh, one of the chapters in Why Writing Matters, uh, I exhumed the first page of, what, of Blumenberg the Elder and printed, I guess, the first two paragraphs and, and rang changes on it, mm-hmm. um, saying, you know, this is pretty good, but would it have been better with if it were in the third person than the first, if it were in the past sense rather than the present? Um, if it were objective rather than um, putatively ironic in tone, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that caused me to, to, to look at the whole book again, uh, as I hadn't in at least 30 years, probably longer. Um, and, I, uh, you know, the good news is that I'm a better writer now than I was then, and the bad news is the same. <laughs> It's it's a pile of irredeemable nonsense, but it had a certain um, youthful brio and and cheerful energy that I can't claim to have or be able to reproduce any longer. And so I thought, well, you know, let this old man look at what that young man did and uh, see if he can ring changes on it and see if there's anything to salvage from it. I, uh, I'm not being coy about this. I still don't have any idea of the answer, whether yeah. it's yes, no, or maybe. But I have enjoyed spending the last couple of months sort of retyping it, if yeah. nothing else. <laughs> uh, 
and getting back into that way of, of being in the world. Um, so, I think that's an answer to your question. Oh, there's never any questions, you know, with me. It's just open-ended, <laughs> I trail off and then we start talking. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that sense of getting something out of your system mm. and then going back and, and looking at it, I'm, I'm intrigued by. Yeah. Um, and we didn't, before we started recording, mentioned a certain author and his metafictional wackiness, um, where it occurs to me that, right. you know, you writing about the writing of, of who you were back then or who right. this writer was back right. then might be an interesting angle to pursue. Right. Um, not that I'm going to be your editor or anything like that. I'm just some schlub <laughs> from New Jersey. But do you think in terms of, of fiction at this point? I mean, you've done essays, nonfiction. You had a, a novel I, ten years I ago. do... Uh... For a long time, I, I think I'd published 10 novels before I published anything else. Mm -hmm. And uh, then my uh, great and the last dead friend, Alan Chews, said to me, you know, uh, you know something about literature. You've um, uh, been teaching it. You could write about it. Why don't you try a little nonfiction uh, at some point? And why don't you uh, vary uh, the form uh, or the genre with which you engage? Um, and I did that and um, was kind of delighted uh, by it. Then I began to write some short stories. And then I wrote another work of nonfiction. And for five or six years, I, I sort of had left the novel behind. Um, I may have talked to you about this the first time we talked, because it, it remains a sort of vivid image for me. According to scientific analysis, the bumblebee is, is too fat, and its wings are too small, and it moves them too slowly to ever get airborne. It can't possibly fly, yeah. but cheerfully ignorant of this, <laughs> the bumblebee just goes up and does that. And I was kind of that cheerfully ignorant kid. Um, I didn't realize that it's difficult to write a novel, so I just wrote novels. Um, and about ten books in, I was sort of you know, hovering up there in the middle distance, and, and I said, mm, yeah. you know, it's, it's, Should it's, I be able to do this? <laughs> yeah, how, how, do, how do people do this? And, and I went, crashed down and wrote only um, nonfiction and uh, then tentatively some short fiction and so on. Thereafter, and pretty much for the rest of my writing career, I've tried to vary it a book of fiction and a book of nonfiction, the thing that preceded. Um, why Writing Matters is a novel with uh, no doubt appropriate title of It Is Enough. <laughs> uh, and I do seem to be uh, under contract to produce a volume of short stories uh, next year. Um, partly the two books of short stories I've previously published and mostly the, the, the ones that have come out of late. So I'm still sort of in that back and forth mode. This is a response to your question. Yeah. Uh, do I still think in fiction? I do think of in fiction, uh, in fictive terms, uh, still, but in all um, simple truth, I don't know that I have it in me to undertake a major novel. This is my, my next question, yeah. and it's, again, a mortality-driven one, but I, right. I recorded with John Crowley a few years ago. Mm. And Amos had said largely the same thing in, in press about, about his last book. In the 70s and a little bit older, that's pretty much it. The, the big novel is, is done. Keeping it I all in your it, head I is the, the challenge. I think it probably is. Um, and we saw Roth went to 150-page, you know, almost novellas for his last four before. Right, right. You know. That's been one of the pleasures of looking back at my 400-page excrescence, Bloomberg the Elder. <laughs> I you can know, mine see, this and make something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I can, I can do it without, without the energy of invention. Um, I, I think it is almost certainly true of uh, a fiction writer that the large, ambitious novel, and by which I mean the sprawling, uh, epic tale, 
um, gets harder and harder to envision um, and less and less uh, easy to approach or possible to to approach. I, I've, I've just reviewed, in fact, a, a book that hasn't come out yet, uh, which is a series of short stories by Hilary Mantel um, called uh, Learning to Talk, uh, which are mostly uh, older stories of hers. Uh, I think the first one came out in, in the 90s. Um, but we think of her as this you know, this massive yeah. a, achievement, uh, and, and I do think it's a massive achievement, the Wolf, uh, the, the Thomas Cromwell trilogy. Um, it doesn't surprise me that what she's doing right now is writing small um, uh, <laughs> and first-rate fictions. Uh, I, I did write, uh, again, to revert to the back and forth between fiction and nonfiction. I wrote a book called Lastingness, um, which is about artists, uh, paint, uh, painters, writers, and musicians who at least maintain and in some degree advance their art past the age of 70. Um, and uh, there aren't that many who do. Um, but there are more than we automatically assume. And there are many painters and, and, and musicians, it seems to me, who... Uh, who produce in, towards the end of their careers what we construe to be their masterworks. Um, not that many novelists who do. It tends to be that not your first or even virtually your first uh, novel, but somewhere in early mid-career you get, you, you spread your wings and feel your muscles in a way that um, gets harder and harder to maintain in older age. There's probably physiological explanation for this, as well as psychological and mental. But on the face of it, it's still, it's still hard for me to accept that one can't get better as one gets older. Uh, I mean, I would know that I couldn't do that if my field were, you know... Major League Baseball, et cetera. Or yeah. ballet. Yeah. Um, uh, sure, I mean, there, there, there's a finite physical uh, limit, but... In theory, we tell ourselves we can substitute, you know, craftiness, or why not be stentorian and call it wisdom? Oh, uh, uh, too. For, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm still thinking in baseball terms, like right. a junk ball pitcher well, being exactly. able to get to his forties. Exactly. But, but yeah, um, I, there are a few examples of, of splendid work done by people in their great old age. For me, the model uh, right now, uh, though he died, he was an elderly man when he died, is, um, but not chronologically so in our present terms, is um, uh, Thomas Mann, who wrote a thing called The Confessions of, uh, or a story about Felix Kroll in his, I think, still his 20s, um, wasn't satisfied with it, put it aside, and returned to it at the end of his life, and picked it up almost without stopping, and, and published uh, as more or less as his last, The Confessions of Felix Kroll, which is a fascinating conflation of an old and a young artist. And I suppose in the back of my brain, that's what's um, pressing me to work on Blumenberg, <laughs> the elder. <laughs> um, but uh, Wallace Stegner's best books were his last, it seems to me. And... There are there are several examples, but we but they tend to be distillations. They tend to be reduced and yeah. again in, that in, Rothian, in, you know, yeah, exactly the, the, the nemeses. I, I think um, Roth's last novel, which the were, nemesis was yes, the, the final. I part. think that's a, a, it's uncharacteristic and it's excellent. Yeah, I, I recently went back to it when I had a, a sequence of Roth related guests. Mm -hmm. I thought, let me. Start with that. Maybe I'll I'll go backwards through his body of work, and I abandoned that project pretty quickly. Yeah, sure. But rereading Nemesis for the first time since it came out, it was the yeah. This this is a summation, and this is a guy who I believe knew this was his last publication. Uh, quite possible. Quite yeah. possible that it was a, a not a Valentine to to his new work, but no. a bit no. of remembrance. Yeah, and and. And not I, uh, carrying some of the themes that, that so weighed his, his work. As long as, as long as you've 
named his name. I was with him in Bennington um, in the, the weekend that he came to visit Bernard Malamer, who was a mentor and a friend of mine as well, and, who, and, and a colleague. Yeah, you mine, mentioned in, a, right. in Why Writing Matters. Um, and this was just after Roth. I think he came over from the Atta, um, just after he had had his first, and perhaps in a certain sense, his, his largest success, Portnoy's Complaint. He had just suddenly exploded yeah. from, uh, from the, the substantial but, but finite career, uh, and, and he was suddenly kind of a culture hero, or a cultural figure of consequence anyway. Um, and Byrne Malamud was beginning to decline, um, and that that disciple, master, or son and father uh, configuration that we talked about a little earlier was very much in play. That right? it's the it's the weekend that gave rise to his ghostwriter. Yeah. Um, and I do think it is fair to say of Malamud, for instance, that as he aged and grew weary, his prose did too. Um, partly that was a physical uh, uh, matter. He just didn't have the, the stamina that he had in his early years, his baseball years. Um, but the author of uh, The Natural or The Assistant was, was a larger writer than one of his last books. And um, that process of diminution is, is hard to see, uh, hard to witness if you care for the person, but almost unavoidable. Nonetheless, um, one has to manage it. It's, I mean, it's a different approach to it, but it, it's, um, I mean, it comes up in Amos's depictions of, of, you know, Bellow's later days when he realizes Bellow is slipping. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. I had a guest in his early 90s, who uh, an artist who another artist had turned me on to and said, you've got to record with him. You've got to get together sooner rather than later. And we were a few minutes into the conversation when he repeated the same story about three times in, uh, in five minutes. And yeah. I had that moment of, oh, God damn it. Now I've got to be completely quiet because I'm going to have to edit this so people don't realize <laughs> that this is going on for this, this artist. And I'm going to make this experience as pleasant to the audience as possible. Mm -hmm. But secretly, this is, this is what's happening. Um, at the same time, when you mentioned, for example, when you were writing uh, Blumenberg when you were young, that you didn't, you, you didn't see how batshit insane it actually was for you to do this. Um, do you measure yourself against your writing in the, the process? Do you see, uh, I, I don't have it today, or you know, this is just not an area I can. That's an push. interesting question. I mean, uh, to um, in my conscious self. I was trying each book out to do something other than that, which I had done before, and to uh, vary rather than repeat my work. Um, was that conscious? Not, uh, was that deliberate on your part? That, it was pretty much deliberate, Because yes, authors but, have always told me it's the damned if you do, damned if you don't. Either he writes the same book again and again, or why did he write something different from the book that I like? And, and the audience thing is... well. It's yeah. it's a problem that bedevils anyone who write, who publishes more than one book. Um, but uh, my model to shift the, the art form was more that of Picasso than of Brock, mm -hmm. his great you know associate, who uh, or Giacometti. Um, I, I I valued um, variety. And would consciously not wish to repeat myself. In retrospect, however, it's quite clear that I did, um, <laughs> and that there are certain subjects that I could tackle and certain that I couldn't. Um, certain strengths I had and certain weaknesses I had that were uh, inalterable. So that um, one discovers at a certain point patterns in one's work. And the question then is, do you want to play to that uh, or play against it? Um, and um, I'm not sure that there's a value charged uh, ranking. Uh, I mean, yeah. 
There are certain kinds of authors who, who, who stay entirely within their modality and their form and, and probably are right to do so. Um, but others shift, I say. Is it ultimately driven by what you expect an audience to, to follow you with? Or I, I just, again, don't know. And, and it's something you bring up in the book itself when you're discussing MFA programs that mm -hmm. you want to focus on the craft and not the profession. Right. And, right. you know, those are two very, very different things, of course. Um, I, I have to say in all sad candor that I don't have an audience large enough to... Um, uh, to weigh heavily upon <laughs> sure. me. Uh, I, I mean, I don't think of the little lady in Duluth uh, or the uh, extravagant hordes in Austin and San Francisco who are just waiting for the next Del Um I, I, I'm playing to an audience of one by and large. But even when you were, again, writing those first ten novels in but, relatively quick succession, yeah. was there a sense of who was reading? Or was it really... And again, it's not an internet era. There's much less right. audience, you know, direct interaction with authors. But to revert to uh, the man who I said I no longer read, Nabokov, <laughs> uh, he said that uh, his ideal audience was lots of little Nabokovs, <laughs> <Sure. laughs> um, people who who knew uh, everything uh, that he did, and perhaps ideally a, a good deal more. Um, I... <laughs> I trust me, I used to say that, you know, this is a general interest magazine, this podcast, if everybody had my interests. But if that was the case, we'd be living on a square planet in Superman costumes flying backwards or something like the Bizarro. So, you know, I, I get the audience thing is not exactly my, my strong suit either. Right. But, you know. Well... Um, it's an interesting issue. I mean, uh, you, you can write for two kinds of readers. Uh, the one is the one who has, in effect, taken the Evelyn Wood speed reading course and so goes at a great rate through your, your pages um, and tears through a book and kind of notes when there's a chapter that's dense with description and a chapter that's got dialogue in it and gets some sense of the shape of the whole, um, but really has only uh, the largest overview. That great Woody line, Woody Allen line about um, reading War and Peace uh, last night. And, and, uh, and somebody said, well, hey, yeah, what, what do you think of it? What was it about? And he said, it's about Russia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can, you, you can, to some degree, uh, plan and program for that reader. And the other reader is the one I just referred to, um, the ideal reader, the lots of little Nabokovs, who pays preternaturally close attention to every syllable and, and understands not only what you are doing, but what your predecessors did, and so on and so forth. So the first person is maybe 10 in 100,000, if you're fortunate enough to have that many readers. The, the second variety will be one, uh, if that many. But that still leaves us with 99,989 uh, readers to, for whom you you attempt to prepare. Uh, and uh, this may be one of the reasons why I've never had that sort of readership. I don't see any way to prepare for them because they come at you with a greater or lesser degree of attention, a greater or lesser degree of education, a, a, a good breakfast or a bad dinner, uh, anxiety about their health or a, a lovely love affair the night before. Um, I'm in or, the anxiety about the health part. So yeah. I'm just kidding. Go. <laughs> um, and, you know, a flickering light uh, in, in a subway or a perfectly positioned spotlight above their favorite easy chair. You can't you can't really program for that because to do that is to try and imagine what the common denominator is. 
Is there an attempt at getting that across? Uh, you, you, again, talk in the, the book about your experiences with MFA students and, and again, work on the craft. And, mm -hmm. and I'm very thankful for you including one of your, or the, the main syllabus for your strategies and prose, mm -hmm. because it reminds me again, I never would have had the, the ethic to, to actually right. become a real writer. Instead, I'm just a, a dilettante who, you know, manages his, his dilettantism just fine. But, but that sense when you're, you're working with writers, not necessarily about the profession, but about, for whom they're writing, what what you know, and this gets at the question that I asked last time about how students have changed, which you mm. couldn't really answer because of the variety of students you you dealt with previously. But it, but it turns into the question, which we'll also get to, of how has the writing changed yeah. of, of students? Uh, this is also a, a function of forests and trees. I, I'm not sure that I can provide you with it. A useful overview. Um, I could, however, provide you with another glass of water. Oh, no, I'm all good. Have <laughs> <I'm> a long <laughs> drive home after this. <laughs> um, how to put that? Uh, first of all, the majority, indeed almost the totality of my teaching experience has been in MFA programs um, or in advanced undergraduate curricula. Uh, so that I'm preaching to the already converted. Sure. Um, I, anybody who takes a course uh, of MFA study is likely uh, to want to be a writer a priori or to dream of it. And uh, I don't have to turn myself into a pretzel in order to um, uh, uh, persuade them that writing matters. Yes. <laughs> um, and therefore... The question of their anticipated audience is not crucial to me. I mean, I, uh, I think I've always wanted in a classroom, and that was true of the, of the, the other students in the classroom, to talk about uh, the ideal shape of the story at hand or the novel in, in progress and not, you know, who's going to who's gonna snap it up yeah. as an agent and then a Hollywood... Uh, producer and so on and so forth. Those discussions, which may well be um, current uh, elsewhere, were elsewhere for me. I, I, I stayed pretty close to the page. Um, I do think it's clear that uh, the locus of, of, of energy in, in writing no longer resides in the novel or the poem, but uh, or even perhaps in uh, the nonfiction uh, text, the memoir, as a friend uh, calls it. Um, but in screenwriting and screenplays, there are probably 15 aspirant authors who want to write for television and the movies for everyone who wants to write for Alfred Knopf. Um, and um, that's part of a larger cultural conversation, which... I don't have the throat or, or the patience for. Um, but, but are there different, I, I don't mean mm -hmm. is it different quality of writing, but are there different qualities to the writing that you see from, from students as that trend towards the, the screen progressed? Oh, oh I think so. Um, I, I once uh, spent some time with John Cheever, who just come from a uh, screening or perhaps the, the opening night of uh, that film of his, The Swimmer. The one where Burt Lancaster at 52 looks like he's 35 years old and, and yeah, yeah, just, just made my wife drool. The entire, yeah, that, that one. I seem to remember that relatively. That one, right. you know. um, yeah. To me, uh, I haven't seen it in a long time. No, I, I don't, don't let your wife watch it. I, I'm just right. saying, she's, she's just going to look over at you. Eh, you know, I'm just kidding. Go. Um, <laughs> but Chiva was not pleased. He said, uh, damn it, uh, next time, I, next everything I write, I'm going to make sure it cannot possibly be filmed. And, <laughs> you know, that, that there's an inwardness to it or a set of angles uh, to the description that can't be uh, replicated uh, in, in film. Um, because you mentioned Burt Lancaster, uh, I will, again, circling back, uh, in my 
in, in that book uh, on, on elder authors or elder artists, I talk about a remarkable book called The Prince. Um, uh, uh, sorry, The Leopard. Yeah, um, which I think uh, we talked about last time because it's in my notes somewhere and it's one of my all-time favorite novels. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. the great and unproduced novel. And, and uh, we probably did talk about it because it's much in my mind, even if I can't remember its name. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and it was his, his swan song. Um, uh, we were discussing elder authors. He wasn't technically all that old. He was in his 50s, when, yeah. but it, you should take some encouragement from this. Uh, he, um, it was really the first time he took Syria, writing seriously. And I think it's because that he had a, a cousin about his age who wrote what my producer thought were second to seventh rate poems, but who suddenly got praised and won a prize in Italy. And he said, you know, I... I'm as good as he is. I'm probably better than he is. I'm going to write a novel. <laughs> and out came... Uh, uh, Il Gattopardo. Uh, Il one Gattopardo, of the... exactly. What you maybe don't know is that the great Burt Lancaster, who um, figures in that, no longer quite as alive as the swimmer, and but perfectly embodied the prince. Um, okay. He was uh, Visconti's second choice. Uh, Visconti had signed up um, uh, Olivier, or had asked him to yeah. do it, and Olivier, I think, wanted to, but then fell ill. So grumbling, he went yeah. over to Lancaster, who he knew from the old acrobatic uh, days, the trapeze and, uh, artist, and trapeze <laughs> artist, and he said, "Well, what the hell?" And the guy embodies the part. I mean, it is a perfect performance. Um, he's really an underrated. Uh, or, not underrated, but, but insufficiently overlooked. remembered. In, in overlooked some, is yeah. the right word. I mean, I came to him late. It was really local yeah. hero in Atlantic City. Yeah, and I thought, yeah. Oh, my God. Because I had heard yeah. the name growing yeah. up, but it was yeah. a different sort of context for those, those art, uh, actors of the 50s and 60s. Exactly right. Then going back and watching, it's like, no, that, that guy, uh, he, he had he something. He knew what he was up to. I will say one of my favorite moments in the history of the show was recording with Sandy McClatchy. Mm. And... He was in the midst of writing his uh, the libretto for uh, opera of the leopard and mm. described the end of the first act to me, and it was just just the, this incredible moment that just gave me chills at the time, and still does when I, I recollect it. And it was I yeah, think it's finally getting staged uh, sometime this year. Well, but. Yeah. Well, he was he was quite something. Yeah. Was. Anyway, uh, this is a long. Uh, Let's see, Cheever. Uh, I think we were, uh, books but, getting adapted. Well, uh, quality well, of writing. That's, right. That's, yeah. The question was. Is there a difference between writing for screenplay for the screen and writing for the page? And the answer is absolutely. Do you um, see that in the students coming in before they've declared, you know, I'm, I'm doing this because I want a Netflix deal? You know, is there something where you, you look at a student's samples and just think, yeah, this this guy, nice writer, but this is clearly somebody who's angling for TV? Um, there are more and more. Uh, Courses in, in writing yeah. for screenplays and and uh, more and more film schools that sort of you know in, embrace that aspect. So I don't know, but again, it just may be that I'm ignorant um, of it. Uh, what proportion of those who apply to MFA programs secretly wish that they would, would yeah. be writing? Really their... want to make it in Hollywood as opposed to right. Yeah. Um, but they're not, in fact. All that wrong if they want to make a life, um, because more people, though it's still a, a mug's game, more people have a chance of making a living uh, as yeah. as a screenwriter than they do as a novelist. But I, uh, just to turn it back to what are more familiar terms of conversation for me, the um, the imagination is a different sort of thing. I mean, you've got to have an ear for dialogue, for instance. You've got to embrace conciseness. Um, you have to uh, scant description. Um, and you can tell pretty early on in, when someone's in the room with you <coughs> if they have visual imagination in effect or a verbal one. Um, and so whether they're barking up the right or the wrong tree. Gotcha. Uh, that was one of the more fascinating passages of the book actually you cite a, a lengthy email from your daughter about 
her work as a showrunner for a Netflix series and how the experience of the writer's room mirrors or, or gives her back a sense of the, the workshop scenario from an MFA world. Um, it, it's really, I found a fascinating section, but I wondered, had you ever considered that, you know, what that writing environment is like? You know, had it ever occurred to you that, you know, um, there's actually something that's sort of MFA like? Frank Schetter, Francesca wasn't um, merely the showrunner for that. She was the author. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I'm embarrassed and to say, I, have, I put it in my queue, but I haven't watched Friends, with, uh, Friends, Friends from, from College, college. yet. Yeah, well, she's, even as we speak, embarked upon another rather large um, uh, TV sequence and series called uh, called Platonic, mm -hmm. which uh, you will, will make see note. next year. It's starring Seth Rogen and Rose Byrne. And um, so she's very much in that world. But when I, and I guess the context of asking her to add to, to Why Writing Matters was that she had been a, a serious <laughs> series. <laughs> um, <laughs> Right. No, no, we don't want her to listen as, to this as, and get as, mad at you. No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, she published a first-rate novel called uh, Ask Me Anything about 10, 15 years ago. Um, and she said to me, um, her husband, who's a, who's a, who's a very large uh, presence in Hollywood, uh, has people who kind of coming over to his office, and they're all sitting there together laughing and working on stories and... and um, and just having a terrific time. I mean, there's, of course, a lot of artwork and, and you know, grim labor that goes into it, but the experience is essentially collaborative. And, um, and because it's comic, it's, it's, it's uh, good-humored. Um, he, too, has a movie coming out very shortly called Grows. He's, uh, well, I don't know. Is it the Billy Eichner yeah. Film? yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard. Well, I'm I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, I did an episode with a guy who did a book on the history of rom coms oh. recently, and he just. I wish we could have put the book off for a year because there's so many things coming out like bros that I really wanted to include. Well, you're, but, yeah. good for you and good for him. Uh, we just saw a screening of it. It's really wonderfully funny. It's good. probably going to be a, a large success. He doesn't write. Uh, my son-in-law is also called Nick. He doesn't write with me in mind as his audience. Um, uh, I'm not his demographic, but his first movie was Forgetting Sarah Marshall mm -hmm. and then Get Him to the Greek and yeah. Neighbors and all. I mean, he's a very large player in this. And he and Francesca are collaborating on Platonic. Um, uh, why am I saying this? Oh, uh, oh because, yeah. because she... She and they have children uh, and to whom she's devoted and with whom she spends many hours each day. And she said to me, "Why, when I'm finished with uh, you know the business of of, of or the happy uh, business of mothering and then sending them off to school and waiting a few hours uh, so I collect them, would I?" Um, lock myself into my study in order to be alone. No, I'd far <laughs> rather uh, be with other people, uh, like-minded uh, artists and sensibilities, and that's the collective pleasure of Hollywood. To me, it's a kind of hell. Um, <laughs> I don't enjoy collaboration. Yeah. And in fact, I wrote a screenplay for the film of my first novel, and it was uh, so bad that I, yeah. I, I simply haven't written it. I mean, nobody's asked me, but I'm. But I, the answer would be no um, about uh, entering that that world. Uh, it, but for a certain kind of uh, writer, and Francesca is a first-rate one. It's exactly what she wants. Is there that sense for you of a, a writing community, not a collaborative world? You mentioned people who you know you trust as readers, but is that the same as a, a writing community for you? Uh, Decreasingly, alas, because um, you know, here again, mortality uh, rears uh, its ugly head. It does. Uh, you know the the line from *Divine Comedy*. You know, I had not thought death had undone so many. Um, so many. I had not thought death had 
undone so many and watches them parading into purgatory. Um, what am I trying to say? Right, community, I, I, death, at this uh, age and yeah. stage, most yeah. of my colleagues, frankly, are dead. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I have carry on conversations with them, uh, three uh, that, that take stage center in, in, in this book, uh, Updike, Gardner, and, and Baldwin. Um, but if I, um, if I listed the writers that matter to me and with whom I'm conversing in my head, there are very few of them still alive. I have a few, um, mostly contemporaries, coevals, um, who matter a great deal to me, and some with whom I've become friends only recently. The, the writer James Carroll, for instance, and the writer Paul Theroux. Um, we've become close in the last five to ten years. Um, and that counts, but it's not the same as it was when we were all in the same room sort of saying, listen to this, or yeah. what do you make of that chapter? The collaboration is, is different. Now. Yeah. And younger writers, are, is it just too much of a student dynamic, or is it, it you know? I would feel... Um, I don't get along it, with people younger than me, so I have no idea. No, I still <laughs> love seeing... Uh, my students, yeah. my uh, but that's a writers, different but relationship. It's a different it? relationship. It would be embarrassing for them, I think, and for me, I know, for, for me mm. to say, "What do you think of this chapter?" You know, or yeah. tell me uh, how I did uh, in that um, dialogue. I, I, I can't. I, I, I don't think I would subject them to that, and I wouldn't want to subject myself to it in a way that was sort of habitual years ago when we were all looking at each other across a crowded table in some sense. Yeah. Now, when we recorded a bunch of years ago, you, you mentioned that you um, sleepwalk your way through much of life. Still hold up? I got you. Well, you should write that one down, but I've got yeah. it here. I'll, I'll zap it yeah. over. <laughs> <laughs> Still feel that about it? A... Um, yeah. I'm. I, what I meant then and would mean now is that I, I am alert to language in a way that I am not to many other things. Um, and um, yeah, the wonderful scene with Updike in your your tribute to him, where he sees this house and it's, it's a roof in a way that you've not seen yeah. it as a million times. Well, before, but he was but, he was preternaturally observant. Yeah, um, he was just so so such a close witness. Um, I I'm not sure that's as true. Now, uh, as it was when I said it to you five years ago, largely because I sleep my way through. <laughs> through, through indeed, it's time for my mid-afternoon nap. My bad. Uh, I'm keeping um, it on. Uh, but but that essential sentiment uh, remains the case. I mean, things that are happening over there or over here are um, things I notice, but that don't. Touch, you should touch me deeply you in the way that a few matters do. The, the one thing that has been added to my life in crucial consequence since we were together uh, is our grandchildren. You know, I I thought long and hard about marriage and whom I would marry or ask to be my wife and. I thought with some degree of attention and, and focus on the business of becoming a father and what that would entail, I really didn't think about becoming a grandfather. Um, it, that's what old people <laughs> do. Uh, and it's also, um, I, I just gave it no thought. But it's really been the unalloyed blessing of the last decade. Um, it delights me to know that these five little um, folk uh, are, are on this earth and that I will see them from time to time. And um, so I pay attention to them uh, and don't sleepwalk entirely when I'm with them. But uh, otherwise, it's pretty much more and or less of the same. Are you trying to make sure they don't go into the family business or uh, encouraging it? Um 
Well, in a sense, both our daughters are in the family business, insofar as it is a business. But yeah. Francesca is. Uh, yeah, but I mean, I mean, with the grandkids, you got to watch out. No, the grandkids love uh, uh, love language and engaging. It. I I don't have this verbatim, um, but it's somewhere. Our, our eight-year-old granddaughter just finished her first novel, and she wrote her her. Yeah. Her author's note, um, which I can almost quote, uh, Frederica Stoller lives in Los Angeles. She has names her mother and her father and her sisters. Uh, and uh, when she is not writing, she is you know, talking to her girlfriends and going for a swim. She is not married. <laughs> <laughs> that last line is a direct quote. The rest of it was a paraphrase. Yeah, but <laughs> so I asked her why. Why did you know? Why did you do that? And she said, "Well, in the writer's bios, it always, always says, it always yeah. says with it." <laughs> and like you say, imitation is, is where all <laughs> exactly. this stuff comes from. So I guess as a, a just as a, a general last question, mm -hmm. the pandemic. How was your experience? Let's make it the last question because... Um, it is time for that nap. But, yeah, it is yeah. time for that. Uh, in personal terms, it was it was fine in, in the sense that uh, I never contracted the disease, nor did anyone uh, intimate uh, uh, be close to me. It was a shock, um, of course. We spent most of it in our house on the Cape, um, which is a, a much more private place. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, really for two years, we sort of barely went out. I've been living in the woods for two years. This is, this is a stretch for me, sitting face-to-face -face with somebody. Exactly. So. Um, the one thing that was true for me that may not be true for you or others of your age is that I felt that it hastened the process of aging. Mm -hmm. I felt that um, I grew more and more comfortable with less and less. Yeah. Um, as it happens, I love and respect my wife, and I think it's a reciprocal trade agreement. So we were each other's great companions, and um, I didn't feel the need that you described to escape in, uh, uh, on a daily basis. <laughs> Run off basis. into the woods and disappear. Right, right, right. Yes. No, in that sense, it was fine. Mm -hmm. um, and not except in the obvious way, is threatful. But I did feel a sort of a, a closing in, not to say a, a shutting down, that I'm not sure I'm in a position to alter. Uh, or uh, Getting over the inertia is very, very difficult. Yeah, and it's... Is. The way I characterized it was there's no more... During the, the heaviest days of lockdown, there's no serendipity. You don't bump into anyone. Exactly. There's no one out on the sidewalk. Exactly. You, everything has to be deliberate. Well, and it it changes your mindset. What a when, good way to put it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and also the charms of, uh, of the world and, and, and social life uh, yeah. really diminish. Um, we've canceled more dinner dates of late than we've made. Um, I... Uh, that's why I had all those pharma meetings last week. These are guys I've known for 20 years. Uh, and, you know, we, you miss the face-to-face the, the face -face that isn't mediated by a screen. You know, the, the sense of the conversation in the hallway, just the... That's another thing. I, I You know, I'm on several boards and needed to be involved in several Zoom meetings, it seemed to me, every week. I hated it. Yeah. Uh, and... Um, and I'm always looking at my own tile to see if the light is good and, and you know, what my hair looks like. And, you know. <laughs> but anyway, that's either here or there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that was Nicholas Del Banco. His new book is Why Writing Matters from Yale University Press. Came out in hardcover last year, just came out in paperback now. I enjoyed it a lot as I think we get across in our conversation. And if you're a writer or just a devoted reader, it should be on your shelf too. Now, um, 
there's no way to keep up with Nicholas's stuff. He has a website, but that hasn't been updated in years. It's Nicholas Del Banco, all one word, which is I N I C H O L A S D E L B A N C O dot com. I'll put a link to that in the show notes in case you want to check it out. But he's not on social media. Uh, he doesn't tweet, doesn't post pictures of crazy stuff on Instagram. Um, I like to think that's a good way to get 30 plus books under your name over the course of your life. That said, you should dive into his work. Um, I first read Curiouser, Curiouser, the essays that led to our first podcast, and then went on to read a bunch of his nonfiction as well as a, a recent novel of his, The Years. Um, he's, well, he's got more than 30 books, and he has had the sort of career that I think younger writers today can't even fathom. And it's it's sad that that world is pretty much gone, that those options really aren't there anymore. But you know, I'm awfully glad to get the opportunity to to talk with writers like this to to you know remind us of what that literary world was like and maybe what it could still be like. Anyway, um, if you want to support the Virtual Memories Show, you can do that by telling other people about it. You can um, just tell them there's this guy doing these interviews every single week with writers and artists and cartoonists and musicians and publishers and translators and and all sorts of other creative people. You can also uh, support the show by telling me what you like and don't like about it. Uh, tell me who you'd like to hear me record with or what, what book or comic or movie or TV show or piece of music or art exhibition or piece of theater or whatever you think I should turn listeners on to. And you can do that by email. You can find my email through the, the website for the podcast or by sending me a postcard or a letter. Um, I send postcards every day now. I send one postcard every day. Um, I've been working through this big box of New York City photos and art from the Metropolitan Museum of Art collection. Um, and that's been kind of fun for me. Uh, if you zap me uh, your mailing address, I'll, I'll send you one of those too. Anyway, you can send me a postcard or a letter or you can leave a message on my Google voice number which is 973-869-9659. Um, that goes directly to voicemail, so you don't have to worry about me picking up and getting stuck in a weird conversation. Uh, messages can be up to three minutes long. Uh, let me know if it's cool to use your message in an upcoming episode of the show. I would never use your audio without your approval, but you know, if you're cool with it, let me know. Um, otherwise, you know, if you want to give money to someone, don't give it to me. I've got a day job that treats me really well. Uh, I was even able to expense most of the, the visit with Nicholas because I was doing work stuff first, visiting the private equity guy. So if you really want to uh, contribute to individuals in need, go through GoFundMe, uh, Kickstarter, Patreon, TopatoGo, or other crowdfunding uh, platforms. If you're looking to help with institutions or foundations, uh, I give to my local food bank and the Poor People's Campaign. There are a lot of different things that you can do, uh, both of those sorts of things, as well as freedom funds, election funds, refugee funds. Um, if you have a little bit to spare, there's a lot you can do to, to help build a better world. So uh, I hope you will. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. 
I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 